and it's uh, an honor to be with some of the people who I actually read and uh, recommend to my students at Columbia. Uh, David Edelstein is the chief film critic for New York Magazine, as well as the film critic for NPR's Fresh Air and CBS Sunday Morning. Eric Cohn is the executive editor and chief film critic at IndieWire and teaches film criticism at NYU. Stephanie Zaharek is the film critic at Time, and from 2013 to 15, she was the chief film critic for The Village Voice and was a 2015 Pulitzer Prize finalist in criticism. Um, I'm going to start off by asking. Welcome to the Rob, congratulations on making this really absorbing portrait of a woman who was sharp, opinionated, caustic, and actually did become more famous than many of the films that she critiqued. Um, and I would like to ask you, among other things, how did you choose the interview subjects? Because it's obvious why you would choose some of the notable forces in contemporary film criticism, but Alec Baldwin, Camille Paglia, I mean, when you started putting this film together, what were you wanting in that kaleidoscopic sense? Well, um, first of all, I want to say Gina James is also in the audience, and thank you, Gina, for coming down. Where? From Massachusetts. Oh, my God. Oh my God. Um, but really, the, uh, and Gina was a big part in, in helping me get this done. Obviously, the home movies and, and the, the personal photos of Pauline, but... Um, I really didn't want to just have a film about critics because Pauline, as Paul Schrader said, was more than a critic. She was really just a writer in her own right. That's the way I saw her. And so I wanted people from the other arts. You know, I wanted John Guerr and Christopher Durang, who's here today. And um, I wanted people who were influenced by her, like me, and Quentin Tarantino, David O. Russell. Um, I read her as a, as a kid and you know, late years of high school, college. And, um, you know, I had started making my own movies. And, you know, you, to read this woman, you would never guess that she was a middle-aged woman at the time. But um, she had the same kind of enthusiasm and excitement that I had. And um, so I wanted, I wanted just to kind of have a palette of, of people and voices and people that didn't like her as well. And some people didn't want to be interviewed also. Um, but... Thankfully, most of the people that spoke, like Stephanie and David and, and Paul, were, you know, you can see in the film, fair-minded. And they obviously, you know, weren't uh, acolytes, even, even though, you know, David might have been called a Paulette, Paulinista. Hey, so was Stephanie, huh? <laughs> Not just me. They tarred all of us with that. David, um, since you did know her, do you believe that her reviews were more a function of love, of her love for movies, or more a desire to ruffle feathers? Oh, no. well, she loved being a provocateur, as, uh, as the film uh, so beautifully captures, but... Uh, she, uh, her, her, um, the title of her book, When the Lights Go Down, describes every, you know, that, that feeling that I think a lot of us get, that she, that she put into words more beautifully, which is anything can happen in the next two hours, you know? And she, uh, listen, Pauline was, there was no, okay, yes, there was a hierarchy of directors that she loved, but, you know, talk to Robert Altman, talk to some of the people whose work that she uh, said, this one is a masterpiece and this one stinks. And, you know, this one is a masterpiece and this one is uh, halfway. And the reason I, I say that is because when the lights went down, she was, she opened herself up to any kind of experience. And I think that that, one of the things that she taught me as a writer was how much fun it was to think out loud, to talk about your responses and then to analyze your responses and then to evoke your responses and then to analyze them. And, you know, this back and forth between reason and passion that's constantly going on in her work and that makes her, yes, larger. I mean, I mean she's, she's what many of us aspire to be as a critic. She enlarged the idea of criticism. She made it a great experience, a kind of dramatic monologue. And Craig Seligman said in her... Um, in, her, in uh, the, the memorial service that he thought she was a great American humorist, among other things, so. 
And Stephanie, do you think that her identity as a contrarian was a function, at least partly, of being a woman in a male-dominated profession? Um, you know, I never thought about that as a kid when I would see her on Dick Cavett's show. I mean, um, to me, I mean, I realized now that seeing her was formative for me, but at the time, I didn't say, like, oh, wow, there's this woman on TV talking to Dick Cavett, she's really smart. It was just a given. She was there and she was brilliant. But I, I do think that especially, um, you know, the, the interviews and the, the footage that Rob has chosen really underscore that, that there was a, I don't want to call it defensiveness because that sounds like a really ag aggressive, like fighting against something. But I, I think she knew, she knew deep down that, uh, you know, people were going to be pissed off at things that she said. And I, I think she was both sensitive about it and she was also like kind of ready to take it. And I think her response to that Renata Adler takedown is really telling. That she knew that when you're the object of the criticism, you have to remain silent. And I, I, I mean, I really respect her for doing that because I, I knew it, it, you know, it did hurt her and it must have been difficult. Do you think, can I just ask Stephanie something? I'm sorry, I don't want to take your, your role, but what, <laughs> did you find it interesting, and, and maybe I, I, you know, I, you might speak to this, but the fact that when she was asked, you know, do you get people who, you know, tell them that you change their lives about, about movies, she said, yes, but I get a lot of hate. And, and then the, the interviewer returned to that. Well, but did, did you know, did they, did it change did your life? Did you get led? Yes, but you should see the hate mail. She she did kind of obsess on the hate mail, some some. I don't think I don't think she took compliments well, but yeah. I, you know I don't, I think she got embarrassed by being flattered because she she was a lot, but she was also, you know, criticized. So Eric, when I see a photo in this film of Andrew Saris with notes on the auteur theory from 1962. I'm reminded, because I'm old enough, of a time when film criticism really mattered. Um, I'm reminded, for example, of the way that Saris and Kale interacted publicly and how she famously reduced the very notion of auteurism to directors uh, shoving bits of style up the crevices of the plot. That's a direct quote. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you, um, actually a few things, but um, what, which, films, directors of our current moment, do you think that she would be championing? Because you're in touch with the pulse of a lot of things. You really set the bar high on this one. By the way, I know, I know you meant it lovingly, but to say you're reminded of an era when film criticism mattered no. puts us on edge a little me. bit. It was a time when there were raging debates. In other words, we would read Saris in The Village Voice, who was very gentlemanly and kind of elegant in the way that... Right. And, well, she, that, and then we would read her polemic. And we talked about it. It was the proverbial water cooler. We don't really do that in the same way these days. Right, it's there, more online. There are different channels for it, right? And, and I think in some ways it's become more diversified. There, there, it's, it's, more, it's happening on smaller scales, and it's harder to, to quantify it in quite the same way. So we don't see it. We can't visualize it. And it's harder to mythologize it as well. But it, I mean, you look at, there's all kinds of amazing filmmakers working today who I think Pauline would have loved to dig into. And somebody like Paul Thomas Anderson, for example, I think just missed the cutoff. And, you know, she loved, she loved it. She, she wrote about Magnolia, maybe? No, no she, she, didn't, she didn't write about anything, but I know she loved Boogie Nights. She loved Magnolia. I don't know what she would have made of a uh, subsequent turn in his work, but uh, I, I can report that. that she I can guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's the thing. It's, I think anyone who is, is trying things we haven't really seen before would probably have generated an, uh, a compelling Kale piece. And one of the things that I've found really rewarding about Kale's work is I'm not of the generation where I read those New Yorker pieces and, you know, had that kind of formative experience of saying, you know, this is what film criticism is. I, I was actually 
sort of just miss the, the cutoff. And I think a lot of times when you hear of these greats of a profession, there's this real sense of, well, they really have to prove that to me. And there are some critics who have been canonized who are kind of products of their era or, or the, their appeal has to be contextualized. You read a, a great James A.G. piece or Parker Tyler, and you have to understand the conditions under which they were working and sort of the, the pro style they were using to, to really get at the, the essence of what they were doing. With Pauline, I mean, she has a Rotten Tomatoes page. You know, you, you can read these articles from a contemporary standpoint, and, uh, and they resonate. And uh, I've been teaching Kale for five years at NYU, and my students are really excited to discover a writer whose work speaks to them, even though she was writing in a different era. And that's really the mark of a great artist. Absolutely. I just had my students read Pauline Kale's review of The Unbearable Lightness of Being. And that is one beautiful piece of critical prose where she really explicates Milan Kundera as well as what Philip Kaufman was doing. And I could see that my students were sort of energized by her simultaneous intelligence and adulation. Um, in, in fact, Rob, I'm gonna ask, you didn't include Philip Kaufman in this film at all, and he was one of the, the great beneficiaries of her approbation. No, and he, uh, I asked him though, but he, he declined. He just, he, he's one of those people who likes to really, um, I don't know, plan what he says more, but he, he just didn't feel comfortable. I was coming out to San Francisco to shoot other interviews and he lives there and it was kind of a last minute thing, so he didn't make it. But um, he did say that he didn't like my title because he thought, he thought Pauline would not like my title because it was too pretentious. Pauline, yeah, she wouldn't the, the, have liked The it. art of part, not the what she said part. Oh. Yeah, she, would, she wouldn't have liked your title, but, who, but fuck her, you know, she's not around. You know? That's what she would have said. That's what she would have said if some, what she would have said, yes. Actually, I shouldn't even predict what she would have said. Because, I mean, okay, I, that's a shame about Phil Kaufman, though, because I remember Phil Kaufman sent her, uh, did you ever go to see movies with her at the Mahewi? the crumbling theater that was in Great Barrington, he sent her up uh, quills, I remember, and might have sent her up, you know, and, and it wasn't like a DVD. He sent her up 35 millimeter, and they, and they projected in there, and she invited some friends to see it. And it was, it was difficult to tell her that I, I didn't think it was, it was so great. Um, but she, you, could, you could disagree with her. You really could. People don't, don't realize that, I mean, you better know what you're talking about when you do, but it's... It was terrific that uh, that she let some of us. I mean, I mean, yes, you you wanted to drink in her wisdom, but if that's all you were there for, she hated it. She hated it when you wrote and you sounded like her, despite all these people who talk about acolytes and slavish imitation. God, I try hard not to imitate her. I mean, it's. I, sometimes I'm, you know, because her language is so distinctive and it's so infectious, you know, you know this. Sometimes I'm writing along and, oh, that's so Kalian, and I force myself to write with a British accent, so I'll, I'll get out of it, you know? I mean, you know, write like P.G. Woodhouse or, you know, uh, Ken Tynan just to stop writing about Kale, writing like Kale. And Stephanie, for you too, do you sometimes hear that voice when you're writing your reviews? Um, not so much anymore, maybe, and I think it's partly because I'm very used to not having her around. Um, I, I do think about her, sometimes I'll see a film like um, Phantom Thread is an example, and I just, I wish she were here to see it, and, and I think that often, um, like I just wonder, what would she have made of this, or what would she find this as hilariously awful as I do? Or would she see something in it that I am just totally missing, you know? And so um, in, in that respect, I mean, I, I, I miss her voice so much that it's, it's uh, um, it, when I'm writing, it's a kind of a faraway thing for me. And then it becomes more immediate when, when I turn, you know, go back and read her. But there's a lot of, a lot of her in you insofar as I think, when I look back on my work since she passed away, I think I've gone soft. I think I, I, think I give too many good reviews. Uh, I think she would look at me and say, oh, God, you've gotten so mushy. You're, you give the filmmakers the benefit of the doubt. Whereas I think when you see something, you, can, you, you still have that toughness, which, which I really love. Yeah. And what you just said about Paul Thomas Anderson, most of us reviewed him on our knees. So. <laughs> 
I have at speak. least five more questions, but have received a signal that we are going to have to vacate the theater. So I just want to say that for a first time filmmaker, because you've done short films, Rob, but never anything that could be a feature, I, I really congratulate you for capturing you. so much Thanks. of the woman and her legacy. And thank you to the critics who've joined us today. Thank you.